a sensational comeback. A statement victory. The smooth operator has done it again. He lost an appendix at the last Grand Prix. He wins. What a performance. What a comeback. A Ferrari 1-2, headed by Carlos Sainz, who wins the Australian Grand Prix. <laughs> this is amazing. The life is a roller coaster. Smooth operator. Oh, I forgot. Smooth operator. Welcome to F1 Nation from the Albert Park paddock in Melbourne. We've got so much to debrief. Science's third Grand Prix victory, Max Verstappen's first DNF in two years, a McLaren podium, double points for Haas, and a miserable weekend for Mercedes. Joining me, Tom Clarkson, is the gang from the Channel 10 Australian Grand Prix broadcast. And what a cast we have host, Scott McKinnon. Hello, Scotty. How are we? Great to be here. Great to have you on the show. We have commentator Richard Crail. Tommy, great to be back. We have former racer and F1 pit lane guru, Sam Power. Mr. Clarkson, pleasure. A lot of fun this weekend, a lot of fun. It's been great, hasn't it? And then we have Channel 10 presenter and probably the funniest man. <laughs> this is a build up. The funniest <laughs> man on Australian telly, Tim McDonald. Couldn't be here today. It's Ollie Beerman with you, and it's great to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. And of course, we have our very own Damon Hill, 96 world champion, double Australian Grand Prix winner as well, DH. Yeah, lovely to be here. It's been great. I've been working with this group of fantastic presenters and uh, yourself with uh, Network and 10 yourself. Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, listen, you didn't have to add that, did you? You, you know. Uh, but um, anyway, this is, uh, it's been fun. And uh, we got a race. We got a bit of uh, excitement. We got a bit of action. A um, little bit of, you know, emptiness in the middle. But, but otherwise, it was a good race. Well, let's start with the smooth operator himself, Carlos Sainz. I think it's not only the last two weeks. You know, it's the, the whole start to the year in general, how the year started with the news of the non-renewal. Then you get yourself fit. You get yourself ready for the start of the season pushing flat out and then you get to Bahrain, you do a good podium, you say, okay, now the season is uh, starting well and I can uh, keep the momentum going and suddenly, boom, the missing a race in Jeddah and the operation, long days in bed, not knowing if I was going to be back in time and uh, obviously a lot of unknowns. Am I going to be back fit? Am I going to be back feeling still good with the car? And then suddenly you come back and win. So, yes, yeah, what I said on the radio, you know, life is a roller coaster sometimes, but it's, it can be really nice and and good to you sometimes and uh, yeah, just letting it sink in and, and enjoy the moment. How apprehensive were you coming into the race about your fitness over what 58? What is apprehensive, sorry? How nervous, nervous. were you? Nervous. Um, I was confident about the, the first half of the race that I was going to be okay because it's more or less the laps that I did on Friday. Obviously, the second half of the race was a bit of an, un, an unknown. But um, yeah, once I got up in front and I had a gap, you can manage everything. You can manage yourself, you can manage the tires, you have less pressure, you can choose your places where to push and not to push, you know, and uh, and it's everything becomes uh, a lot easier. So, yeah, I'm not going to lie. The last five, ten laps, I was a bit stiff and tired, but uh, nothing that was slowing me down too much. Well, tell us a little bit more about the race now, and particularly those opening couple of laps and the moment you pass Max Verstappen for the lead of the Grand Prix. Yeah, I got a decent start um, from the dirty side of the grid, but obviously couldn't put Max under pressure into turn one. But from there on, it was a very strategic first lap and a half where you are wanting to protect the tire from opening up the graining. But at the same time, I knew this weekend and this this race, I could have the pace to, to challenge Max. And I said to myself, with how powerful the DRS is around here, if I get myself within the DRS range in after lap one, we can put him a bit under pressure. and. I think he did a mistake into turn three uh, that allowed me to to stay within the RS and I could feel myself being pretty quick. And then, yeah, I don't know when his brake started to go, but um, yeah, uh, in dirty air, obviously, it's it's not the same than in, in clean air with a big up. Do you feel Ferrari have got closer to Red Bull this weekend or do you feel they weren't maximising their package? What's the feeling in Maranello? I think our car really worked really well this weekend, but I think it's going to be tough, you know, to keep it up there uh, in every track until we bring an upgrade to close that gap that we saw in Bahrain and 
and Jeddah, uh, but uh, around Australia, from lap one, it felt like a race-winning car. And even if Red Bull were also quick and were on pole, that 59 in quality wasn't out of reach for, for us. And yeah, there will be tracks where we are strong, like we saw last year. And this year, it seems like our race pace is better, even on those tracks that we are stronger. And uh, with, together with a good development program, I hope that we can challenge Red Bull more often. So guys, how impressive was Carlos Sainz today, given everything he's been through in the last couple of weeks? It's a great sporting story, isn't it? It's the kind of stuff that the journalists in the press room dream of writing. It, the headline of Carlos two weeks after surgery to have the appendix out, winning a Grand Prix, but then beating his teammate in the process, leading Ferrari to the first one two in Melbourne in two decades at a racetrack that is enormously parochial to Ferrari. This is a Ferrari town, Melbourne, and if an Australian couldn't win, it's great that a Ferrari could. So I think it's an amazing story and it, and it shows how good Carlos Sainz is as a, as a product and as a racing car driver. And I think there's all sorts of other questions that could pop up that we can deal with later as to whether that team's made the right choice to let him go. But it's probably added a million dollars to the price where he goes <laughs> next year, I would have thought, Tom. Well, you know, and he gave it a bit more context in the press conference. He said, yeah, OK, it's been the last two weeks, but actually this story starts in the off season when he was told that he was not going to be re-signed by the team. And it just sort of adds to the sort of epic nature of it. Yeah, but what motivation to perform? And it, it happens so often in professional sport that a football player gets sacked from a team and then goes out and kicks two goals or a, a racing driver is let out of their contract and goes and wins a Grand Prix or whatever it might be. It's it's a powerful motivator in professional sport to, to kick on, Sam, and, and clearly... Carlos has done that, didn't have the opportunity in Saudi to do it. Ferrari didn't have the car to do it in Bahrain. The opportunity presented here and he grabbed it with both hands. Yeah, he's done a phenomenal job. And I think the next question is, you know, we, we thought that Mercedes would be in the pound seats with this driver market, taking their time, they can have the pick of the crop, etc. But given his performance, do you just go, well, let's snap him up now? Because, I mean, a straight swap has got to be the obvious option for Mercedes. So, I mean, this guy's going to be hot property for sure. What about Red Bull? Good question. They, I mean, this is a really interesting one because he obviously went up against Max in the very, very first period where Max came into Formula One. And I think because everyone didn't realize how special Max was, we sort of wrote Carlos off so quickly. And then he, you know, he sort of had that sort of, I guess, a, a bit of an era, a, an ethos sort of around him that was uh, an aura rather that he wasn't quite on the same level as someone like Max, but he's just chipped away and proved himself time and time again. I mean, look at how he goes up against Charles Leclerc. It's phenomenal. Yeah. So yeah, it could, could well be possible, sure. Uh, Damon, I thought Carlos's victory in Singapore last year was hugely impressive. Was this even more so? I think so. I think given everything that you, you know, put into the pot, the fact that he's, uh, as Richard was just saying, you know, the fact that he's been told he's, surplus to requirements after the end of this year uh, I think somebody could be demotivated by that but he's not that kind of personality and he's basically it's a liberated him I perhaps to go and sort of go well I'm here for me and I'm going to use this Ferrari and I'm going to do what I do and the, the, you can you can tell me to stop or whatever but it doesn't matter because I, I'm fighting for my survival and you, and you either, you know, when people are down, they either get back up again or they stay down and crawl away, you know, and he's not doing that. He's not that kind of person. He's shown he's got fight and the fight is really powerful. And, and I think he's, um, he's expressed himself fantastically well this weekend. Has anyone here had their appendix out? I genuinely have, have had my appendix out. Could I have driven a race car two weeks later at 300 kilometers an hour? Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that hard. But that's the, that's the thing. That goes to show how motivated science is to advertise his services. He, everyone would have forgiven him if he wasn't racing this weekend. But he flew all the way around the world to Australia to be here, to be up there on the podium. That is, in, a, in and of, of itself, a hugely impressive athletic performance. Can we go back to Saudi just for a moment? Because all you guys wanted to talk about after that was Ollie Behrman. Do you remember that guy? Yeah, the guy in the car who jumped in at the last minute to replace him. Could you imagine Carlos watching that and seeing the headlines generated out of that, TC and Damon? I mean, seriously, he, he would have been sitting there going, hang on a second, this little kid jumping into my car 
and getting all the headlines and finishing in P7. Yes, terrific performance. Let's not say that that's not an outstanding effort by the young man. But then Carlos comes along here. I didn't think he would race. That was my first impression when we were doing a preview show. Do you remember on the Thursday we were like touch yeah. and go whether he'd do a session and just go, no, this is too painful. Not just that. What's he no. lost two kilos? He two didn't kilos. look well, and then no. he still gets on the top step. So I think he was massively motivated by what he saw from Ollie Behrman. And you guys talking up the young kid, he was like, oh, I want to show sorry. you <laughs> but, <laughs> what but it's all about. It was a great performance out of him. Oh, sure. Yeah, it was all you, Damon. Him about, yeah. Remind him before every race about Ollie Behrman just <laughs> lurking over his soldier like some vulture, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it's a very good point you make because we weren't sure he could actually drive. Mm. And you look at his face, his face is completely different. Doesn't look He's definitely lost a lot of weight. Mm. Um, so, you know, not being able to train as hard, not being able to, uh, you know, boost your energy reserves and stuff, uh, it's, it's remarkable the way what he's done. And bear in mind, with the new regulations, drivers are only allowed a maximum of four appendix a year, four gallbladders, <laughs> two pancreas. <laughs> so it's incredible. It is incredible. Well, let's move it on now to Charles Leclerc. He came home in P2 and claimed an extra point for the fastest lap. It's been a long time uh, since we have had the genuine pace to have Red Bull, I wouldn't say under control because we don't know what was the real pace of Max today, but I will say that from FP1, we knew that pole position and the race win was possible because we had very good tire degradation, very good pace, and that is a very encouraging sign. However, if you look the first three races, two out of the first three races, they had the upper hand in the race, so we still have a lot of work to do. But um, that's exactly what we need to do as a team, is whenever we have the opportunity to actually uh, win a race, we need to take it. And uh, this weekend we uh, we did it, Carlos did it today. Uh, on my side, second with the fastest lap, so there are no, not any points that we have got uh, more. And uh, looking back at the first three races, there are not uh, one race where we didn't maximize the results. So we need to do that until we get the car that is consistently better than uh, the Red Bull, uh, especially in the race. As you said a moment ago, you, you got fastest lap today. Was there any more? Was there anything more you could have done about your teammate to steal the win? Just being better. Uh, I, I think in qualifying yesterday, I haven't been good enough. In the second stint today, on the f the first uh, hard stint, I had quite a bit of graining on the front left after the safety car. The last stint was really good, but it it wasn't enough. So uh, Carlos have just been better this weekend, and uh, but it's been. Uh, like that's in the last three years where we basically will arrive at one race and Carlos will be better and then I will push and then I will be better at the, f at the next race and then we'll improve like that. And that's, uh, that's very exciting as a driver to have such a fast teammate and he's really been on it since the beginning of the weekend. So congratulations to, to Carlos. Now, Crayley, how do you think Charles feels that his teammate has won twice since he last won at the Austrian Grand Prix? It's a very good point. Uh, and, and both times they've been quite truly meaningful victories, haven't they? Singapore last year, arguably one of the better races of, of the 23 season. Uh, it, it, that inter-team battle in Formula 1 is so important because the first person you've got to beat is your teammate in similar gear. The other point is is that uh, the stats were popped up during the race that had they swapped positions, Shaw will be leading the World Championship. And yes, it's only round three of 24 and the longest Formula 1 season they've, there's ever been. <laughs> Having said that, it's still a factor that they need to take in. So I wonder if that played in their mind, and then would Carlos, who's departing the team, have even considered such a thing? But um, I think Charles would be pretty quiet. I thought his post-race interview with Gunter Steiner was reasonably reserved. Um, he was philosophical. He looked like a driver that had finished second and lost to his teammate. And Carlos had been magnificent all the way through the weekend, hadn't he? Very impressive in qualifying. Just missed that one minute 15 lap, which he attributed in the press conference and said, I didn't quite get there in the end. But um, yeah, Carlos was the man today. Damon, not not just this race, but that's not is... me singing in the background, if you can hear it, by the way. <laughs> 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 who do you think is the stronger driver out of Charles and Carlos at the moment? Do you know, you're not supposed to say this, are you? I don't but know what you're about to I say. Think, I'm, I'm I all think, in. and I have felt this, going back to when Silverstone, when Carlos was giving instructions and to the team about his strategy. You know, he's, and, and it, Charles was sort of saying, 
tell me what you know tell me what to do or getting annoyed that he was given team orders and these are the marks of a driver who is aware of and able to cope with uh, loads more information when they're driving and Carlos is smart you know and he and I think he showed today he's not only a thinking driver uh, he's also fast you know and actually in a race Charles for whatever reason he was out qualified by Carlos and also he was out raced by him because there's a sort of general perception in Formula One that Charles is faster over one lap and then there's not much between them in the race do we now need to revisit that and, and actually say, no, there's very little between them over one lap? Oh, I think over one lap, Charles probably still has the edge. But as Damon was talking about the smarts of Carlos, I mean, think about what he did in Singapore with the, the whole DRS thing as well, using that to his advantage. Like, he's a wise, wise cat. And oh, it's interesting you mentioned the Red Bull thing. I mean, Sergio... He struggled today, really, when you consider the performance of that car. Could you imagine those two together back at Red Bull? I know you touched on it at the start, but I mean, if he's doing that in a Ferrari and everyone's saying what a weapon that Red Bull is, especially with the straight line speed, that'd be a pretty formidable combination. I think the, the other thing is, is that you win points on a Sunday and in an era where you have to be millimetre perfect to take on Red Bull, you want someone in the car that when the pressure is piled on, they absolutely deliver. And you look at what Carlos has done in Monza, in Singapore last year, now in this Grand Prix, he has not put a foot wrong when the pressure has been at its peak. And I, you know, for that reason alone, he's, he's got to be considered right up there, at least as his equal, for sure. Now, not only did the drivers get it right in this Grand Prix, Ferrari got it right. They've often been criticized for their strategy in the last few years, but they got it spot on today. Is that man Fred Vasseur finally getting this race team the finely tuned operation that it needs to be? Pit stop's perfect. Only one reference in team radio to either strategy A or strategy B. Um, they didn't even mention C, D or E, so that was a tick. <laughs> That's progress. Exactly right. Um, it, it feels like a race team that has got their P's and Q's together. They seem like they're in a really good position. They've got two intense drivers. They've got a plan though as well. So they've got this long-term plan where Lewis Hamilton's joining that team and they've announced it basically at the start of the season. So their long-term planning is clearly working well, which which bodes well in itself for car development and how they're going to progress this car throughout the course of the year to try and catch the Red Bulls. Seems like they've got it together and, and every Every time we hear Fred on TV, it just seems like a guy that understands what it needs and has got that really calm, level-headed management style that's going to be beneficial to Ferrari moving forward. And he's building a great culture. I was out the front of the garage when they were doing the team photo and the guy spraying the champagne over the whole team was Fred. Yeah. Wow. And the whole team were around him. He was absolutely loving it. So he is bringing just such a great energy to that team. The man who has finished every Grand Prix since he retired from this one in 2022 has smoke from the rear of the car. Max Verstappen has an issue. The man who is trying to win 10 Grand Prix in a row for the second time in his Formula One career will not continue the run. A fire at the back of the car. The dreams of victory gone. Uh, in the car from my side already when I had that moment in turn three it was very weird why that happened because you weren't really pushing you're just easing into the race you know settling in but um, of course once I got out of the car you look into the data and um, basically what happened was from the from the when the lights went off uh, the right rear brake stuck on and um, yeah, it didn't cool. So it just kept on being warmer and warmer, giving me really weird instabilities. And then of course it caught fire. Um, of course you always want to fi finish the, the races, but uh, it's a mechanical sport. You know, these things unfortunately happen, but I think it's the most important of course that we understand why, why it happened. So reliability is Red Bull's era over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Did you happen to stick anything in their <laughs> rear brake ducts at all by any chance? Like Chris Packard. Well, what about their reliability? They've been bulletproof, right? Since this Grand Prix two years ago, it was surprising. And, and, and yet Max said the issue was there from the outset, from the moment he accelerated away from the line. 
Scotty made a good point on the broadcast actually that you know there were a lot of people complaining about the the responsiveness of the brakes. So whether or not they just tightened up some tolerances maybe and just tried to get a little bit more bite out of it. I mean, you know, maybe it's also got nothing to do with it. But it's uh, it's it's surprising from Red Bull. It's something that you know that you'd think that they'd methodically check time and time again. But just goes to show you know these things can happen. Yeah, and it shows they're human. Yep. And you, you know we, we're used to Red Bull incredible pace incredible reliability and that going back to Ferrari the interesting thing is they have now capitalized on a Red Bull mistake which they have to do if they have any chance of competing probably mainly in the constructors yeah, that's a good point unlikely in the you have drivers. to be in it to win it yeah. yeah great teams fail sometimes in any level of professional sport you could be on your way to a undefeated season in Premier League football but you might still drop one or two games to lifting the big trophy if this is the one or two games that Red Bull drop for the year, it's still going to be an unbelievably good year. And with the intensity in Formula One, the pace of development, and, and frankly, the tough nature of this circuit. I mean, this is a couple of years in a row now, Albert Park's thrown a few pretty serious curveballs at, at this field. Um, sometimes it happens, doesn't it? And sometimes you don't even need an explanation to it. And it's interesting for Perez, isn't it? Because he's got a lot of wraps in this season because he's had some podiums and he's, going, he's doing what he needs to do to keep that seat. Part of his other job, though, is that when Max isn't able to win, Perez is expected to take the win, and he was nowhere today. He was nowhere, and in fact, you know, the, the, the impeding in qualifying, the three-place grid penalty, then, you know, You'd comes home It's a harsh thing, though, Tom, you know, hmm? it's harsh, really, because he didn't do such a bad job in qualifying itself uh, to give a, be given a three-grid, you know, but, you know, if that's Max, and he, was, he started, where did Checo start? Fifth? No, sixth, sixth yeah. He, and Max would have won the race. That's what I feel. That's what we all think, you know. And you're making you're making the right point. That uh, Checo is, you know, he's a good driver, but he's only good if if Max is winning. I think I think one of the the, the things that's interesting now is that Red Bull feel vulnerable. It feels like Mercedes, when Red Bull were just trying to expose a chink in the armor, when they were trying to hunt them down, the pre the 2022 era. Now this feels like the reverse, and I think people are sensing that opportunity. I mean, sure, they're going to have some strong tracks. We expect them to be strong in, in Japan next week, but I genuinely think they haven't got the advantage that the whole world thought they had at the start of the year. Let's wait till Imola. They've got a big upgrade I'm coming. I'm being here, optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's there, good. I mean, it's yes, good that I, you're optimistic, but, yeah. you know, it's, uh, they are still a phenomenal racing team. I, I think the thing that I feel about this race is that and maybe this season, is that Ferrari typically in the past have pretended to be a threat and they've managed to drop the ball. And I, I just thought this weekend they didn't. I thought this weekend they actually would put in a very, very solid performance all the way through from day one. And that's a really interesting change in, in the dynamic. I mean, whether it's Fred Vasseur or what, I don't know, but it could be the appendix or it could be, you know, it could be Carlos's d determination that's lifted the game. I don't know, but they definitely did a great job this weekend. Pit stops were good. Strategy was good. You know, I know they benefited from a, a dropout, but nevertheless, they kept the pressure on Red Bull at least. Lando Norris will climb onto the podium for the 14th time in his career, and it's back-to-back -back fourth places for Oscar Piastri, who is roared home by the crowd. Whoop, whoop. Well done. Awesome. First podium. Not far behind the rest. It's getting exciting. I'm excited. Lando, coming to you. Very many congratulations on your 14th career podium. Was this one unexpected? I think when you when you take the Red Bull out of it, I would say no. Um, I think our pace has been good all weekend. We showed good long one and high fuel pace on Friday, so I wouldn't have said uh, we had no chance. I didn't expect probably us to be competing against uh, the Ferraris today. I think our pace was not as good as Carlos, but probably better than Charles. So I think um, if I was being honest, we maybe missed out a little bit on an opportunity to be P2 today. but. Yeah, for us to say that is, is a good sign. And I think, um, yeah, it's a good positive for the whole team. Uh, it's a good boost. It's nice to be back on the podium. And uh, yeah, whether or not the Red Bull was there or, or not, our pace was good today. And, and uh, hopefully that continues for more races. What more could you, could you have done about Charles? Perhaps the, the undercut at the second pit stop? Was there? Yeah, the, the, the lap we were going to undercut, he boxed. So then again, you have to go on off and, and do kind of a different strategy. So... 
We got close in a second stint. Um, I got very close. Uh, if I boxed, I think I would have undercut. But he boxed, so I missed that opportunity. So you always think, what happens if we did it one lap earlier? But it's, if, it's tough to make all those those decisions at the time. And it can easily go wrong at the same time. There are always so consequences of doing so. So I think we still did a very good job today. Uh, third and fourth for us as a team is, is positive and a good load of points. But they were clearly a, a better team. And... Um, they have a better car at the minute so whether or not we could beat them they have a better car they have a quicker car and uh, we have to work harder until we can uh, match what they're doing well I thought it was interesting that Lando said in the press conference yeah maybe I could have beaten Charles today they had genuine long run pace in that Grand Prix McLaren fastest lap of the race to Lando near lap record um, ultimately cost a little bit by track position at the end and got to three, three and a half seconds of Charles at the end there and couldn't really close in as that second set of hards. They went too late in the race war. But I thought that there were many, many more positives than negatives from McLaren this weekend as a whole. And their race pace with Max out of the equation was pretty much as good as Ferrari, wasn't it? So real positive. And, and it's nice. Sometimes I feel like Lando is under, I don't know if pressure's the right word, but he's a long way into his career, yet to win a Grand Prix. But to be fair, in a team that hasn't given him the machinery to win a Grand Prix yet, I know there'll be frustration still around Monza, where Daniel Ricciardo beat him. Um, but every now and then, you're still getting those really superb drives from Lando today. He was, he was stunning. He was awesome. Yeah, re- inch perfect. And, and that, that series of fastest laps he set towards the end of the Grand Prix, I think lap 45 onwards, and the intensity that he showed was outstanding and just reminded us all that yes Lando is a genuine yeah, hope yeah. For, for world championship and race wins was, if not more yeah and he was genuinely quicker than Oscar Piastri uh, tell us about Oscar guys you know how popular is he has he usurped Daniel Ricciardo in the affections of the Aussie fans everyone points at me <laughs> I would have to say and this is proper rock star status this is a bloke who was a rookie yesterday and you see his poster up everywhere he's now front and center unfortunately Daniel is fading and, and fading fast we've we've loved him we've loved his antics of course he was a winner and has fantastic skill but he's in a gigantic hole at the moment and we love backing a winner especially a young winner with a bright future and a car that seems to be going quicker by the round so he doesn't quite have the same personality shall we say, as Daniel Ricciardo. I think he'll grow into that the more he's at ease in this sport. But I spoke to him just before the race start on as they did the driver's parade, and he still had a bit of fun. We were talking about the Shuey. I'm just so disappointed McLaren made them make that change because he promised on live television that he would do a Shuey if he was on the podium. I didn't think he would. But he grabbed that challenge, so maybe we'll see a bit more of that, well, a bit more of the larrikin in Oscar Piastri, the better uh, he goes. Well, well, it was a bold move for McLaren to switch Norris and Piastri, probably the right call, but a bold move in uh, Os- Oscar's home race. Um, I'm not sure it was very well received by the crowd. I understand that Zach Brown has been detained at Melbourne Airport. <laughs> he might not be allowed out of the country. We, we don't forget that in a hurry. But it was probably the right call because today Lando had the pace and, and Oscar, and speaking to some of his team, he, he was struggling with the tyres. He, he, he just wasn't quite up to the pace of Lando today. Scotty, you found out about his nickname as well before the race. What is it? That was Bruce. What's, Bruce why is, it, why is from, Oscar Piastri called Bruce? Uh, it's something to do with the shark. Is it the Aussie shark? In, you, you'd probably know because he watches a lot of children's television. Finding Nemo, wasn't it? Finding Nemo, Bruce. The 1996 world champion Damon Hill's only contribution for the last 20 minutes has been <laughs> Finding Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen several times. What? I have a son with Down syndrome and he absolutely loves it, so we watch it quite a lot. It's a fantastic movie and, and I was chatting to Oscar and he, he says every Aussie who goes over there gets the nickname Bruce. Bruce. So. Look, how good gutted will he have been do you think to have been asked to make that swap very very I mean he's a hugely competitive guy early in his career as well but um, Oscar comes with the benefit of time and learning he's got Mark Webber in his corner and in his ear Mark will talk him through this as well and I mean Oscar's right at the very beginning of his career he knows that opportunities will present but Scotty was right and um, Tim was right Lando had the quicker car today for the team they had to swap swap those around because they had Sergio Perez behind, they had Fernando Alonso Wiley as ever behind. 
possibly not going to challenge them, but I think they had to protect themselves one way or another. And the, the most logical option from a team perspective was to put Lando in front and let him go after Leclerc. And he got within three and a half seconds, so he had a, a reasonable tilt yeah, at it as yeah. well. And, and then we go to Suzuka in two weeks' time. Oscar was so brilliant there last year, and, and the car seems to have the same sort of performance characteristics as the one from last mm. year. So I, I would imagine they're going to Japan next week feeling pretty bullish. There's a lot of people inside McLaren as well that are just getting very surprised at how quickly he's picking up speed. I think this is the thing is that relative to Lando, how quick he's just assimilating all of this knowledge, figuring out the car, eking out that little bit of performance. I mean, the difference between him and Lando and this Grand Prix was very, very small mistakes. Very small mistakes. And if he gets that right, he is going to be a genuine contender. And that's the thing that's impressed me the most. I mean. Almost every session we have with those two, they are separated by hundredths of a second. Yeah. It's sort of like Lewis and Alonso back in 2007 with McLaren. You know, it, they are really on it. Yeah. And he's focused on those small mistakes because I chatted to him before the race and I said, what a year you had last year, you know. Um, I think it was 96 or 97 points, two podiums, a win in Qatar. And he goes, yeah, but there were some weekends I, weren't happy, I wasn't happy with. And so that's what he's focused on. He is focused on getting better because he wants to achieve at the, the highest level. It's like listening to Mark Webber, isn't it? That's exactly yeah. the attitude well, Mark <laughs> Webber would have I, had. I think this is an excellent point. You know, what a brilliant manager he's turning out to be. I mean, it's He's just cool, calm and collected. I think he's also having the conversations with the team that Oscar doesn't need to have, and so he's just helping him focus on that driving. I think it's kind a beautiful... Kind of good cop, bad cop, right? Yeah, Mark, I, Mark yeah. can be the bad cop, and, and Oscar can just breeze in and... Exactly, it's super so, hard. I would imagine... Mark has probably had a few conversations with Zach Brown about the change. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it was it was probably fair enough, though. I think I think honestly, if you asked Oscar, he'd probably go like, to be honest, he was faster. So you know, fair enough. And I moved over. He expect him to do the same. They've kept it pretty on the level. I think the relationship between them is really, really good. You know, there was no quarrels on the radio. So. I think he'd probably say fair enough. Look, final one on McLaren is uh, news broke this weekend that Zach Brown uh, is remaining at the team or a long-term deal until 2030 as the CEO. They've got stability now. They've got the drivers locked away. They've got Zach locked away. They seem to have a, a technical team that's locked away. They got everything they need. Well, and, and the news that the, the Bahrain Sovereign Fund has purchased the full stake in McLaren the parent company which owns a big stake of the race team as well so even from a, a very very high end level the resource is now there for a business that has struggled financially for some time um, is there to to build on and go forward and, and as you guys know Damon you more than anybody that having that consistency internally is so critical to a good racing car team so if you've got your drivers locked away long term your team principal who pulls all the deals together, gets the money, gets the right people in place to do it. Andrea Stella as well seems like a terrific leader. That All the puzzle pieces are there now, aren't they, to, yeah. to deliver a world uh, championship? And, and I have to say, Zach has to be the person who gets the credit. He's managed to stabilise the ship. He's got rid of the people mm. or he's changed the structure and it's producing results. It's produced stability. It's very, very unusual to have a team that is so fixed with its future mm. like like mclaren is and, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm sorry but zach is i think zach's done that i think yeah. he's managed to put in the right people they get on well and they've got great drivers young drivers they've got they're not going to be running out of steam in, in another couple of years mm. they're going to be getting better and better and so yeah and um, that's good we we have a bit tom to do with zach down here he's his partner through united auto sports with a, a v8 supercar team uh, and Zach strikes us in the Aussie media as a guy that will navigate a business through challenges without letting those challenges affect the business. Zach strikes me as the kind of guy that will isolate the performance element of the race team away from all of that. He can cop the heat, he can deal with the sponsors, deal with all the money that it takes to go racing and do it calmly, controlled in that very professional American businessman style that he is. Um, whilst at the same time being a proper hardcore racer who drives classic Formula 1 cars for fun. I know he's from America, Crowley, but he actually spent so long in England. Yeah, you exactly. know, I know he doesn't sound it, but yeah. actually, you know, he's, he's, sort of, he's sort of one of ours, really. Claim, claiming, <laughs> claiming him for the king. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Here's a shout out to all small business owners. If you're currently hiring or planning to expand your team and want to target high quality professionals who could be the perfect fit, 
you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn Jobs is more than just another job board. It's a goldmine of talent with over a billion professionals ready to make their mark. And get this, 86% of small businesses that use LinkedIn Jobs find a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Talk about efficiency. And you know what's even better? LinkedIn gets it. They know that small business owners like you are juggling a million things at once and may have limited time and resources, which is why they're always innovating to make hiring easier. Like the latest feature that helps you craft job descriptions effortlessly. Use screening questions and skills assessments in your job posts to vet candidates and LinkedIn's intuitive platform will use insights from your job post, your company and its own members to find the people you need fast. With two and a half million small businesses already on board, you know you're in good company. So if you want to find top tier talent hassle free, do yourself a favor. Check out LinkedIn Jobs today. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash F1 Nation. That's linkedin.com slash F1 Nation to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Here on Big Crash, George Russell with a massive accident at the end of the Grand Prix at turn number six, and that will end the race as a contest. The virtual safety car is out, but Russell, pitched up by the wheel that's underneath the car, chasing down Fernando Alonso and finding the barrier on the last lap. Really don't know what happened, to be honest. I was half a second behind Fernando on the entry of the corner, and then suddenly, you know, before the apex, I was right in his gearbox and lost the car, ran wide and hit the wall and then it was obviously a dramatic few seconds after that but disappointing end to uh, a, a difficult race. Obviously I was focusing in front of me and not behind. Uh, I had some, some issues uh, for the last 15 laps or something on the on the battery, on the deployment so yeah definitely I was uh, struggling a little bit at the end of, uh, of the race but uh, yeah I kind of focus on the on the cars behind. I knew that uh, he was um, coming and uh, we were uh, he was on the DRS distance for already five or six laps so yeah he was um, it was very close and um, as I said I was just doing qualifying laps and, and trying to to maximize the pace. Now it's been a miserable I think we have to use that word miserable weekend for Mercedes. Lewis Hamilton of course retiring with that uh, power unit failure, George Russell crashing on the last lap. Now, I slightly felt that Fernando Alonso was teaching him a lesson. I, I felt that live today. But as we're recording this show, Fernando Alonso has been given a penalty, that 20-second time penalty that drops him down the order. Sam? I mean, it looks like, it looks like George is generally being taken surprise by Fernando into six and that corner now is extremely fast it used to be much more of a 90 degree corner bigger braking zone etc um and obviously fernando's trying to defend against that sector two enormously long drs train uh drs uh, length there so he knows that he was vulnerable one place left to attack so you know if that's the case it'd be a real shame um you know damon and damon we were talking about it before and it's not quite how you want to go racing. You want it to just be an out-and-out -out battle, don't you? You don't, you don't want to have that happen. George got, was surprised. It looked to me like he was very surprised to find himself closing the closing speed on Fernando uh, to be so great. Or he just got it too close. He was pushing too hard and got understeer because he was under his, rear, under his gearbox. Well, that clearly wing. wasn't the case, I guess, because otherwise Fernando wouldn't have got the penalty. You know, what is Fernando Alonso meant to do? On the last lap of the race, they're just about to enter the high-speed section where, of course, George will have oh, the DRS. This Isn't is, it part of a driver's yeah, yeah, yeah. armoury to be able to I understand. play those games? Yeah, and I do think this is where we get into the... The, the difficult area of what is racing and what is dastardly tricks, you know, uh, which uh, we, I think you have to assume the FI want to stop people doing things that are potentially dangerous, but then it is dangerous. Motor racing is dangerous and you have to be careful when you're going for a move on someone. If you're closing on them, you've got to be prepared for them to do things that are gamesmanship. You know, I, I just think this has to be part of the sport. You know, being wary of an individual because you've, they've got form or they're clever or whatever. You know, I just think 
The idea that you, you've got to stop people from doing anything unexpected, that's not, that's not really racing. So it's one of the hard things about Formula One, the speeds are so high. I mean, we, we'd see these, these kind of things happen in so many other series, you know, people parking it on apexes because they know they can't take another line and then getting a good run out of the corner to defend against what might be a stronger car down the straight. So we, we do see this quite a lot in other, in other forms of motorsport. Um, but given that it's resulted in a massive crash, I suspect that's probably added a bit of an emotion to the situation. I want to know what it means for George taking over this team leadership role. If he is crashing right at the death of races, when that's when you need to cash in and, and get as many points as possible. I mean, is that affecting things there? Is that pressure getting to him? Is he trying to eat too much out in a final lap when he should just be settling for where he sits. I think the other interesting thing is that, that listening to Lewis, he, they don't seem to know definitively where to adjust the car and what direction to head. And that's very worrying at the start of the season when presumably you've got some upgrades and presumably you want to then try and hone in the window of the car and figure out how you can make it operate in a really wide window and make it pliable and malleable for the drivers to be able to get speed out of. But they just generally don't seem to have a great deal of info on it. Well, and proof positive of that was that glorious ray of sunshine that was free practice three, where all of a sudden Lewis and George were energised and they were mere tenths away from the Ferraris and they looked properly competitive. And we all went from that going, wow, this maybe this is a, a three-team fight for pole position. And then in qualifying, Lewis missed qualifying three. So it was a strange and clearly the operating window is so narrow that you miss it by half a percent and you go from being fourth to 10. Let's talk about Haas. Haas, guys, double points for that team. You know, given where they were not very long ago, it's been an extraordinary turnaround. And if ever there was a weekend to test tyre degradation, it was here because a lot of the teams were struggling. We saw it through a lot of the sessions. Goes to show the work that they did in testing where that was their main focus, paid off for a double points finish. We saw the teammates, the Haas teammates, working together as well today, you know. Two races in a row. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's unheard of, but they've seriously got a good thing going there. Well, it, it, it certainly looks like they've massively improved relative to where they were at the end of last season, let alone at the beginning. So, huge bonus for that team. They're, they're another team that should have two very, very evenly matched racing car drivers in, in Kevin Magnussen and Nico Hülkenberg. Um, Holkenberg did the job last time out. Two lots of world championship points here. And it's these points you gain early in the season, isn't it, that can be so valuable when the development race kicks in and you might expect some other teams to either leapfrog them or start dominating those top 10 positions. Crailsey, you're such a pro because that segues us beautifully into talking about Williams and Alex Albon, who just misses out on points in this race. And of course, he was promoted into Logan Sargent's car. First of all, team, do we think Williams did the right thing by biffing Sargent out the way in favor of Alex Albon? I'd, I'd, I'd answer this with a, an almost question, is that Alex, so Alex finishes 11th, just misses out on a point. Is that a pass or a fail? Had he got a world championship point, my argument would be that yes, they probably made the right decision. All right, pre-race, what were you thinking, Crailsey? I was firmly on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> With no firm opinion either way. Um, it was an incredibly tough call, and it's a call that I wouldn't want to have made myself. And I would certainly want to have been the one making the, having that conversation with Logan in particular. Yeah, it's really tricky. I'm going to get off the fence and just say it was massively unfair. I mean, he did no wrong. He wasn't that quick, yes, but... It's his car, he didn't smash it into the wall. And then suddenly it's like, well, too bad. Yeah. I, I just, I find it so harsh and the pressure too. It's almost unfair on the team as a whole. I, I spoke to Alex before the race and the pressure on his shoulders. I was talking about trying to convert it to, I guess, repay the faith in the team and also for Logan. And he said, yes, I'm feeling under pressure. I need to deliver. And he would have been feeling pretty sketchy because he obviously pranged and it was a big prang, smashed up the tub. The year before, he did exactly the same thing. He would have been walking on eggshells out there, wouldn't he? He would have been petrified to do it again. So I don't know if he would have been able to extract the full capacity out of that car. And Logan's going to be feeling pretty unloved right now, isn't he? 
massively unloved. I mean, he's the number two and he felt like the number two, as we discussed. Yeah. And he is number two. He is. Yeah. That I mean, is his car number it, as that's well. That's what yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 I mean, so there's, there's no escaping it. He would go home with his tail between his legs, didn't get to race, and they end up with no points anyway. I think the interesting thing is, is you know, is it going to even out in the wash somewhere down the road? Is it going to come back to Logan? You know, it's it's... It sure is a difficult, difficult call right now. Um, and it's been, you know, watching Alex go through, he's, he's had Logan at the fourth horse of his, of his mind the entire weekend. Uh, that's not easy to do as a racing driver. It's also incredibly foreign territory for a racing driver. You, you focus on your race and your car alone. So, yeah, I hope it does some way find its, you know, karma to resume its normal course on that and Logan gets something out of it. It's also hard to believe in this day and age that a team had enough parts for one car. As in, in my lifetime, I can't remember that happening before. So the idea that, you know, two guys are sharing one car. That said, there are eight of us here and only three microphones. So <laughs> <laughs> it feels about the same. Yes. Do you know what? And the Williams team are going to be busy mending Alex Albon's chassis between now and Japan. I don't know this, but the implication would be that they're going to be having just two cars at the Japanese Grand Prix uh, in a couple of weeks' time. It's a fast track. There's very little runoff. But TC, I want to, I want to ask you, uh, what, what is this down to? As in, this is a very unusual problem. It doesn't happen all the time that there's only enough parts in this case for one car. Is it unpreparedness? Is it they're focusing on other development areas? Well, that, that's the point, I think. It's, it's development. They kept developing this car as late as they could they knew they were, they were going to be up against it at the start of this year but they took that decision they said let's keep this thing developing this thing as late as possible we're only going to have two cars for the start of the season don't crash it lads oops but that's where the problem has arisen and I think there will be a change in strategy well not next year because I think a lot of the, the cars are going to you know, run from this year to next year because the rules are the same in the 26 rule changes is going to force them to focus on that but I think it's been a bit of a wake-up call. James Vowell's just a year into the job. and it, Well, I think he's doing a great job. I think he will rue that decision. Damon, can you put yourself in Alex's shoes? Imagine stepping into a teammate's car after having two massive high-speed prangs around this track. How would you have handled that situation? And would you have gone flat out 100%. Is that the only way a race driver knows how to attack Formula One? I'm, I'm ruthless, Scott. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't say. You'd have won the race, wouldn't you? I'd take the car. Sorry, sorry, buddy. <laughs> I'm better than you. That's the end of the story. I, I, I'm afraid I think I can be uh, found guilty of doing something similar when I had my first drive with a Brabham team. And we shared cars. We had a spare car in those days. And my car broke down and there was, a spin, I think the spare car broke down and then Eric van der Poel at the British Grand Prix um, gave me his car and I was supposed to give it back to him. <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> but I, I honestly think this is now something that people are going to look at their contracts for. I think that, you know, if it says in the contract, I will always be, the team will give me a car to race. And at all times, I will, if, if a situation like this arises, then it doesn't matter, sorry, that's my car. Then, then I think that might be something they'll look at in the future. Where does Logan Sargent go from here, Damon? Everyone has to prove themselves. And, and, and it, you know, I think that he's had a season. He was definitely looking like he was um, one of the drivers who weren't going to make it through. But James Vowles has given him the chance. And he's an American driver. And I think the market you know, in the States is, is huge. As you know, many of our listeners will be from the United States. They want to see a... Uh, an American driver in the sport. They're giving him a chance, they're giving him the best shot, and it's down to him now. But we're seeing headlines that, you know, Mercedes might look to put their young 17-year-old star, Kimi Antonelli, in that Williams seat. Very hard for Logan Sargent to prove his worth when he can't actually drive the car. Joined very quickly now by RB team principal, Laurent Mekiers. What a day for you guys and for Yuki finishing in the points. Look, it is it is a good day. Uh, no, 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 need, no need to hide. You know, topping the midfield uh, we, is one thing. Topping the midfield and getting the points is another thing. Uh, I think we've done everything we could this weekend. Yuki drove fantastically from the first time uh, he has been on the track in FP1 to to how he executed the race. You know, very strong, very smooth, uh, very calm, and and uh, you know, it it 
It gave us the points. Uh, it gave us also the possibility to be quite close to Stroll on the Aston. You know, we out qualified both Astons yesterday. It was a surprise. Uh, we knew in the race they will they will go, uh, but in the end, uh, it is very good that we could uh, finish the race in that way after three strong quali, but more a more hectic races. So it's a good sign. Now I know you only joined over the winter, but. Are the engineers telling you that Yuki has taken a step this year compared to last year? Yes, they are saying that, absolutely. Uh, certainly, in, uh, you know, he's in the right place, he's in a good place right now. He's, uh, he's making very big steps in, uh, in, in how he approaches the races, in, uh, in, in the calm he has in the car. And, you know, he has been, he has been stepping up. Um, so it is an important weekend for us. Uh, also on the other side of the garage, you know, Dan, Dan's uh, pace today was good enough for points. And of course, he started from the back, so it, it, it looks unnoticed, but it's very important that we pick up uh, the right speed with him and give him a car he's comfortable with. And today, he, he was able to, to, to have the pace that was good enough for points. Clearly a challenging start to the season for Daniel, who's so popular here. What are you looking from from that side of the garage to get him up to that level and get him scoring points consistently alongside Yuki? You know, I think the truth is we, we still have some work to do on our side to give him a, a car he's comfortable with. And, and maybe this weekend he had that by the time we went to Quali, whilst on the other side of the garage we were probably having that already in FP1. And this, this has an impact in, in how you perform because it's uh, then the time you need to build the confidence and so on. So we st are still digging uh, with him, with, uh, with engineers, as you would do with any drivers, to try to, to make sure we, we tailor the car to, to, to what he needs and it will, it will come, he has shown in yesterday today. All right, Laurent, many thanks for dropping by. Safe travels, going back to Italy or heading we, up to Port Douglas, doing a bit of swimming. No, on the, no, Italy, um, Faenza, and then England, Bista, and then Japan. And then Japan, okay. E exactly, exactly. You know, the, the truth is, as, as good as the result of today was, we are under no illusion that in Japan, it's press the reset button again, 10 cars within one tenth, and you could be P18 without, uh, before you know it. So it's, it's only when you nail everything that you can hope to top that group and uh, luckily that's what we had well, today. Well done today. Thank you. Think of the air miles, you're about a clock up. Thank you, <laughs> Laurent. So Yuki Tsunoda finishes seventh and uh, well, Laurent, pretty upbeat about his performance. Yuki was good this weekend. Executed qualifying really well, didn't he? Fair to say got the most out of the RB, I think this weekend. Um, especially relative to his teammate. We've got to be brutally honest with that as well. So, um, yeah, solid performance. But uh, th there seems to be pressure regardless of if you're a Red Bull driver or an RB driver. If you're not Max Verstappen, there there's pressure all the time. And those two drivers, I, I think, are still unproven as to whether they're going to be in Formula 1 long term in that team. So Yuki needs to keep delivering what they what he delivered this weekend to keep putting in those performances and we're better to do that than the next Grand Prix at Japan where the, the Japanese have this fanatical devotion to, to Formula 1 especially when they have their own driver on the grid and Sammy you caught up with Daniel Ricciardo in the pen after qualifying and, and you were telling me last night just how dejected he was Mekki is there saying that actually his pace in the race was good do you think he will will this have been a bit of a shot in the arm for him he was dejected. Uh, I mean, we've seen a pretty flat Dan all weekend. I think it's fair to say. Um, I think I think the race would would have buoyed him a, a fair bit. I think also, you know, I think genuinely, the sight of the Red Bull seat. I think it's it's maybe just had him lose a little bit of focus on him as a driver. I think he needed to concentrate more on himself and how he gets speed, um, rather than sort of. Red Bull, will this happen, will it won't happen, etc. So I think maybe that's crept into it a little bit. Um, it's hard to say, but yeah, he, he just needs to really go back to basics and just find himself in the car. Ultimately though, TC, and this hurts, Daniel's problem started when he breached the track limits in qualifying, lost his lap time, lost that opportunity to progress to qualifying to that opportunity to start further up the grid near his teammate which he clearly had the pace to do and then it, it snowballed from there and he ended up in that position where he wasn't able to get world championship points so it's a really tough situation and and there's a lot of attention of it in this part of the world as to what happens and and questions already does he see the season out and that's it's a well, tough question to ask, but it's a tough sport, Formula One, isn't it? It is hard. It's very hard. I mean, but Yugi, just think about this. He's going to Japan next. You know, he's looking strong. 
and uh, that's going to mean a lot to him. And he's going to get his home race. You know, this is Daniel Ricciardo's home race. Hard weekend. You know, can he pull himself out of this? Yuki is fighting. Motivation is is an interesting thing, isn't it? And sometimes you just can't seem to find it. Sometimes you can't seem to get your finger. You can't put your finger on what it is that's wrong. And I, as I got towards the end of my career. I definitely found it hard to, to motivate myself because you've got it in your mind that, yeah, you know, there's another life afterwards. And when you're younger and there's, you, all you see is the future is F1. That's all you see. And I think that you know, Yuki's got to fight for his survival. Danny Rick, he's had a career. He's 34 now. So I don't know. Maybe those things are distractions. It's hard to re-motivate yourself when you're, you can see all the other things that are out there. I think the message for both those drivers, to quote a line from Damon's favourite film, Finding Nemo, just keep swimming. <laughs> exactly. No, you're right. Is that what they, that's the thing, just keep swimming. Just yeah, keep that's, swimming, that's just keep thing. swimming. Yeah, I'll have to watch it again. <laughs> Unfortunately, Danny's swimming upstream because like, yeah. I, I, think he's, I think he's in a massive hole at the moment. I hate to say it as a massive Danny Rick fan, but um, you can see the look all over his face. He's a dejected figure. He's, he got that love back when he was here last year and he, he saw what he was missing out on. And I think he believed going back into that Red Bull stable, shall we say, that it was all just gonna come to him again. He was in exactly the same position when he was in McLaren. Remember how hard he was battling away and then somehow he jagged that victory and it seemed to, to right all the wrongs, but we know that it, that didn't work out in the end. I know there's pressure coming. I mean, there's rumours flying around that he's got until Miami to prove himself. That's yeah. how cutthroat this Red Bull environment is. Yeah. I hope that's not the well, case, and but they, I, I, he's fighting to stay in Formula One. Scotty, and they've got you know, a quality driver in Liam Lawson just sitting there. Who waiting. had his cans on in the garage all weekend, just looking over his shoulder going, I can do better than you. I can do better than you. You know that's what he's thinking every time he's looking across at Dan Ricciardo. So I was going to say, who was he looking at? Dan, not, not you. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, Dan. Yeah, I mean, yeah. both of them. Yeah. I mean, he, he feels as though that he should be in that seat. He's doing all the PR stuff. He's a good looking rooster rocking through here. I think he's marketable. So maybe that's perfect for RB. But unfortunately for Dan Ricardo, I, I hope he can turn it around in Japan. But um, yeah, it's well, looking tough. Well, Liam Lawson was everywhere in this paddock. And Damon, you, I, I don't know if you want to share this story, but earlier you were telling us, telling us a story about how you did a similar thing when you were vying for an F1C. That's right. So uh, when Nigel uh, had left, decided he was going to leave the team at Williams in 92 and there was a drive going at Williams and I was in the frame and I was their test driver, I thought, you know, I can't just leave this to chance. I can't wait for Frank. to. So I flew down to Australia for the weekend uh, for, to Adelaide in 92 and just hung around the back of the garage going, hi, Frank, you know, remember me, I'm your test driver. And um, it must have had some effect. I don't know. I mean, they... It was, um, it was worth doing. I was a bit jet lagged, but. <laughs> <laughs> so the top 10 looks like this. Carlos Sainz took his third career victory and Ferrari's 10th at Albert Park. Ferrari teammate Charles Leclerc was second and Lando Norris completed the podium for McLaren. Hometown hero Oscar Piastri was fourth with Sergio Perez fifth in the only surviving Red Bull. Lance Stroll was sixth for Aston Martin and Yuki Tsunoda seventh for RB, with Fernando Alonso dropping to eighth after his 22nd penalty. And it was a great day for Haas, with Nico Hülkenberg coming home ninth and Kevin Magnussen tenth. In the Drivers' Championship, it's close at the top after three races. Max Verstappen still leads with 51 points, but Charles Leclerc is only four points further back in second place. Sergio Perez is one point further back again in third, with Melbourne winner Carlos Sainz fourth on 40 points. Oscar Piastri is fifth on 28, just one point ahead of his McLaren teammate Lando Norris. George Russell is seventh, Fernando Alonso eighth, Lance Stroll ninth and Lewis Hamilton tenth. In the Constructors' Championship, there are only four points separating Red Bull and Ferrari in second. A double points finish for McLaren solidified their third place in the table, while two DNFs for Mercedes leaves them in fourth, just one point ahead of Aston Martin in fifth. RB are now sixth with six points, and Haas are seventh on four points, while Williams, Sauber and Alpine have yet to score. 
And look, one last thing before we go. We do it every Grand Prix review. Have a think, lads. Your driver of the day. Where are we going with that? Damon, where are you going to start? It's Carlos Sainz. Carlos Sainz, easy. Is Damon speaking for everybody? Absolutely everyone. And I think then he removes a kidney, donates that for the next one, and finishes on top again. I mean, just give away body parts and finish on top of the podium. Tim, any thoughts? Just Carlos Sainz again? No, my driver of the day is my Uber driver who is out the front and has been waiting two hours for this episode to finish. <laughs> TC, I reckon we're done. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you very much for your time. See you next year. Thanks, Thanks TC. So that is the Channel 10 mob. And of course, thank you very much to all of you for listening. This show is nothing without you. And remember, you could be at a race this season and watch the drama unfold like we have here in Melbourne. Japan, China, Miami, Imola, and the rest of the year is now on sale. Go to tickets.formula1.com to book your seat. Meantime, we'll be back next Monday with our preview to the Japanese Grand Prix. See you then. Thank you for listening. F1 Nation is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios.